good evening all respected teachers and dear members today we have a special clinical meeting which i thought uh, let I means a clinical meeting of the compress but i thought let all of them know about this something different thing and i want just to make everyone aware of it so now let me introduce dr anju dr anju is our own member he is a, a kos a member as well as compress faculty uh anju for the people who is she's i mean uh, had one or two sessions in our own academic the kos meetings but for people who are not knowing her i just introduce her dr anju chandran she did her mbbs from kolkata medical college uh, pg from agarwal institute and oculoplasty orbit and oculoplasty from shankar netralaya and now she is uh, in charge and uh, in doing everything in compress under for oculoplasty and orbit it's a one man army there <laughs> she doing a very good job and now over to anju anju please take over thank you so much madam for those kind words uh, good evening again to everybody so like madam said uh, this i felt this is a very relevant topic so for that very reason we have named the session as prosthesis braces so um, thank you again vijayalakshmi madam and sujitha for this opportunity so before we begin the talk first we'll have a talk by celia followed by a small talk by me and uh, to introduce celia we need to all of you uh, she has done her bachelor degree in optometry from uh, pondicherry followed by a long term fellowship in comprehensive optometry and an apprenticeship in uh, ocular registry at the prestigious lv prasad eye institute in fact she is one among the first three people who completed this course when it was started she has had hands on training with renowned anastoplastologists in usa she was a faculty of uh, lv prasad she was a consultant ocularist for 3 years there followed by uh, her stint in kerala for the past 8 years she has been covering the entire of kerala traveling far and wide and do making ocular processes for numerous patients she is also the general secretary of the indian optometrists association kerala and she is a principal of lotus bosch and lomb institute of optometry and uh, by now you already know that she don several hats so she is also the block panchayat member of angurwali a few minutes so uh, we want to welcome you silvia over to you thank you thank you dr anju uh, for the introduction uh, and uh, thank you to comtrust for uh, a great opportunity to uh, in to have a talk uh, on ocular history and as you all know ocular history is a, a very um, rare and uh, a special uh, field and uh, of ophthalmology uh, we usually call an art and medicine uh, actually, uh, dr anju was uh, in, when he, when she introduced me uh, she was mentioning some anaplast anaplastologist renowned anaplastologist in the world so uh, it's a, uh, anaplastology uh, is a wide uh, field uh, of uh, you know artificial uh, processes in different parts of the uh, body uh, ocularistry is a small part of that uh, so uh, you know we only talking about ocularistry uh, today um so i i just want uh, wanted to discuss with you uh, the uh, indications mainly the process of making the artificial eyes uh, and what all the patients will be benefited uh, with this uh, so uh, when we uh, talk about uh, artificial eyes we uh, we always look for a history uh, in this field uh, the first uh, ocular processes may uh, were made by roman egyptian priest uh, as early as the 15th uh, 5th century bc in those days artificial eyes were made of painted clay uh, attached to the cloth and they used to be worn outside the socket um after that it took about 20 century uh, for the first in socket artificial eyes to be developed and uh, initially uh, these were made of wow. gold with color, with colored enamel and then in the later part of the 16th century the venetian started making artificial eyes out of glass uh, so these early glass early glass eyes were uh, very un uncomfortable and very fragile in the socket 
so uh, in nearly in, the, in these days we we are using medical grade acrylic plastic but still uh, in german um, germany they used to make uh, artificial eyes with glass but uh, they have developed a new uh, new techniques to uh, to uh, stop that fragility and all but uh, still you know uh, medical grade acrylic plastic is more common in artificial eyes nowadays we use uh, pm or polymethyl methacrylate uh, to make artificial eyes and uh, stock eyes as, as we all know uh, most of our uh, common patients use the stock eyes it's ready made and would fit patients with the best eye uh, right out of the drawer and it is mass produced uh, in a variety of standard sizes shapes and iris colors uh it's just a, we are fitting a, a by a trial and error method we are not taking any uh, socket measurement and you know what all the uh, ready made eyes we have uh, we just fit in uh, in the socket and uh, advantages of custom made processes over uh, stock eyes or ready made eyes uh, custom made process is always uh, prepared according to the socket measurement we are taking the socket measurement with, uh, with impression uh, trays and uh, then we are making wax model uh, you know we are uh, looking for the alignment and shape size everything and then uh, we are making so uh, it will be very comfortable uh, in the socket and it is made up of uh, high grade plastic uh, uh, high grade medical uh, grade polymer uh, polymethyl methacrylate and always we have, we have seen that uh, with the uh, custom made ocular processes with this material uh, we have seen decreased discharge and discomfort in the patients and of, of course good symmetry with the other eye even even the color uh, color uh, and the size uh, and the comfortability of the patient is uh, uh, very good in uh, custom made processes and better prosthetic motility always uh, the stock eyes uh, won't have any uh, any movement it will just stuck uh, stuck over there because we are just fitting uh, not be, uh, according to the socket measurement we are just fitting uh, just like that so uh, always this custom made process will have better prosthetic motil motility even in uh, without implant eyes also we we are getting uh, good movements and these are some patients uh, who fitted with uh, stock eyes and then uh, we made a custom made process for them in the first uh, photo you can see that a lid lag and it is not actually uh, the patient was complaining about popping out of the processes very frequently and then we fitted with uh, custom made processes and he is very comfortable uh, in both ways uh, he has very good uh, symmetry with the other eye and the second case you can see that ptosis uh, it, it is not not just ptosis uh, without support we are seeing the ptosis so uh, we fitted a good um, a good custom made processes and we uh, we we got correct that uh, doses and scleral shells we uh, usually make the scleral shells these are very thin shells so we uh, make for uh, the spree spree thysical eyes or a uh, thysis bulbae with very well less volume and uh, this will be very thin maybe some, sometimes less than 1 uh, 1 mm to 2 mm sometimes less than also and when we should advise artificial eyes uh, i'm just uh, just mentioning the uh, indications uh, dr anju will be talking about it and uh, this this is the patient uh, of micro it's, it's a microphthalmia patient uh, from uh, the uh, one month of birth one month of age we are uh, starting uh, for him confirm we, we started confirmer for him we started with 3 to 4 mm uh, corneal buttons you can see in that picture uh, we started from 3 to 4 mm confirmer and we gradually increased uh, the size of that confirmer and then we uh, finally fitted a uh, 22 to 24 mm uh confirmer and then we fitted artificial eye for him i actually uh, last 6 months only uh, we fitted artificial eye and have the photo um he is very comfortable we uh, could attain that 80 percentage of that volume um, we could attain and he is very happy and no one is identifying uh, it is an artificial eye and this is an anophthalmia case uh, for this uh, girl also we didn't do any surgery because she is uh, suffering with other uh, problems uh, but with the confirmer only we increased the volume of that socket and then we could uh, fit a, a customized prosthesis 
and this is in post evisceration uh, case uh, in ophthalmia. Uh, I usually uh, do this for optometrist and uh, you know uh, the um, ophthalmic techni uh, technician. So I uh, made that presentation in that way. I uh, anyway, we are, you all of us are very aware of this, but I'm just just mentioning the cases. And this this is a tricycle uh, tricycle bulb. Uh, we uh, fit a sclera shell for, uh, shell for her, and you can see that uh, it's very comfortable and movement was also very good. And uh, cosmetically also she was uh, very fine with that. And these in this atrophic lobes also sometimes we can we will be able to uh, fit artificial eyes uh, even if we have uh, a one to two mm uh, volume inside that. And this is the orbital eccentration uh, case. We uh, usually uh, do three types of orbital processes. Uh, one uh, is you can see that orbital uh, implants, uh, which we are, we are uh, using very rare in India. We, we don't uh, do implants so much. Uh, and the second thing is uh, spectacle mounted ocular processes. And this is we uh, this we are using uh, and uh, initially we used to do this uh, spectacle mounted processes but nowadays we have glues uh, we can uh, uh, we can just uh, stick over the uh, face uh, in the margins we can use that glues and uh, it will be uh, you know very comfortable with the uh, skin and we will be having a releasing agent of uh, agent of that glue so a patient can uh, use uh, release that uh, glue and then they can uh, clean it and use it again. So these uh, three types of uh, orbital process we are using. One is uh, this implant mounted and the spectacle mounted and uh, this uh, glue type. And these are severe orbital trauma cases uh, where we do uh, orbital eccentration sometimes. Uh, in this, these cases also we can uh, have orbital processes. And these are severely de deformed socket or con contracted socket. Most of the time, uh, people won't uh, use any um, custom-made process or any stock eyes, nothing. So uh, eventually, they will be uh, having this problem. You know, it will be contract socket will be contracted, and we won't be able to even uh, two mm or three mm conformer also won't fit in that. So sometimes we'll go for a surgical intervention or 80% uh, percentage time, we will go with the conformers. Uh, we will just use pressure conformers. Uh, and we will give for three months, three to four months pressure conformers. And then we gradually increase the size of the conformer. And then maybe uh, most of the time, 99% uh, cases, we can fit something uh, to hide their def defect. Maybe it will be small or, you know, it won't fit uh, properly. The movement will, will not be good. But still, uh, to hide that defect, patient can use at least for the sake uh, something they can use. And uh, in some cases, we won't be able to correct with um, uh, conformers. In that uh, cases, if patient is willing, we will go for a surgical intervention. Maybe socket reconstruction will go. And this is bufthalmus with corneal opacities. Most of the time, these patients where go for a evisceration plus implant, uh, and then we will uh, they will come to us uh, for a uh, processes. And of course, uh, the, uh, process uh, will move. Uh, Eighty percentage movement will be there uh, in uh, some cases. Uh, if we have a tricycle eye, uh, it, the movement will be more. And also, if a well. Uh, Fit, uh, well fitted implant. Uh, if the patient is having an implant well, well fitted, and then also we'll have uh, eighty percentage of ocular movement. And, <clears throat> and these are conformers we use uh, after surgery. Also, we are using this, and uh, for the socket expansion, also we are using the uh, these type of conformers. And we sometimes we use uh, we make customized uh, conformers for the socket expansion. And fitting processes uh, will take impression uh, from the from the socket. We have impression different types of impression trays. According to the socket measurement, we have 20, uh, from 22 uh, to 26 uh, mm uh, conform uh, um, impression trays we have. Uh, with that, we will take impression. We are using alginate material. It's a in, uh, it's an irreversible hydrocolloid material, uh, which we use. Uh, uh, you know, to uh, take the dental um, uh, measurement also, we are uh, using the same material alginate. 
and then this uh, the same alginate impression we will uh, replicate into the uh, wax uh, and then we will do the wax modeling uh, it's a very uh, uh, quality uh, it's a good quality wax wax so we can just uh, put it in the socket and then we'll do the uh, measurement alignment and the size shape everything will we'll see and then the same wax model we will convert into the pmma and uh, we will do the uh, iris painting according to the patient uh, iris. Uh, most of the time we'll have the brown uh, eyes or dark brown. Uh, and after that we will uh, we have corneal buttons with uh, people and then we will attach that uh, corneal button to the iris. And then we will, uh, we will attach that iris uh, to the uh, PMMA. And then we will get uh, a, a sclera with a, a cornea. And then over that, we will paint uh, uh, all the uh, blood vessels and the limpus. Sometimes people will be having some pigmentation uh, in the sclera. And uh, maybe some patients will have uh, early pterygium. Uh, all these we will make uh, with the painting. And then over that, after drying it, over that, we will have a transparent polymer coating. Uh, we will uh, we'll do it. Uh, uh, we will do polymerization over that and then we will just uh, seal it, that coloring. And then uh, we can dispense COP after polishing it. And all these things, I think uh, we all know uh, care and handling uh, and advice the, uh, pay, uh, for the patients. And most of the time, uh, many people, they advise uh, patients to uh, take out the artificial eyes maybe once in a month and sometimes after two weeks. But uh, when the patient comes to us, you know, they will be, they'll be coming with a full of discharge. So uh, from my experience, I always tell patients to uh, decide the cleaning uh, time, like uh, ever two, once in two weeks or one every day. Uh, it depends upon their routine. If they go out and do uh, a normal layman work and they, they have to clean every day, it will be good for them. Otherwise, they have to use continuously the artificial eye tears uh, because most of the time we, when they come for the polishing in six months or one year, uh, we usually see a lot of uh, scratches over the uh, artificial eyes in the back surface and over the, uh, and the front surface uh, and also full of discharge uh, uh, deposits in the back surface. So I always uh, tell patients to do uh, cleaning every day if they go out and do some works um, or, uh, you know, if they're uh, dealing with some dust and all, uh, it, it, uh, it would be good if they do uh, cleaning every day. And they can use mild soap and the sense baby shampoo, any kind of baby shampoo they can use. Uh, by Sometimes patients uh, seen that you know they have they, are, they have been using this hand wash and soap uh, sometimes even uh, any soap they will get they'll use uh, but it, it won't be good because the polishing will go uh, with that hand wash uh, chemical so it will be good that you know if they use baby shampoo uh, they can maintain the processes uh, very easily at least once in a month will be fine and otherwise they can just wash it uh, with water and it should be polished every six months. Uh, and if they're not uh, ready to come for six, six months, at least once in a year, uh, it should be polished. Uh, because a lot of discharge deposits uh, uh, in the backside of the processes won't go uh, in a normal washing. We have to polish it. And uh, maybe some, most of the time, they'll be having some scratches uh, over the uh, uh, processes. And it will rub on the uh, conjunctiva and, you know, it can cause some inf uh, inflammation. So it, it, it should be always uh, advisable, you know, every six months or at least once in a year, they have to uh, do polishing professionally. <laughs> and when we, <coughs> we should uh, replace an artificial eye. If there is any change in appearance and, uh, you know, they can go for a change. And uh, if they have a recurring, they're, they're complaining about recurring infection, then then also they can go for a, a new processes and some people they will uh, complain about dryness and discomfort <clears throat> and sometimes droopiness of the eyelid this happen most of the time uh, when the uh, socket is big and the um, process is small then also uh, they can see the uh, droopiness of the eyelid and it's a pseudotosis so that time also they can go for a new process and sometimes uh, in a child 
they used to uh, complain about popping out very frequently in that cases also if socket is big then um, the artificial eye will uh, will be popping out so we have to uh, go for a new prosthesis otherwise this pmma is very uh, very uh, safe they can use for 10 years or 15 years if every polish it will be uh, good only so every yearly they are polishing it then they can use uh, that uh, pmma for long time there is nothing like you no know, uh, expiry date for that but you know every 5 years uh, there are many changes in uh, changes coming in the industry so they can go for a new pmm version or you know sometimes the 3d irises are coming so if the patient is willing for the new advancement then they can go for a change otherwise they can use whenever they uh, want uh, 10 years or uh, 5 years doesn't matter and how long does an artificial eye last the same i i, I think i answered that question uh, these are some happy patients and uh, we uh, we can use this optical illusion sometimes uh, even if we fit customized customized process also maybe the size will be uh, big or small uh, according to socket measurement only we can uh, fit so that time uh, we can use this optical illusion we can uh, prescribe minus lenses uh, to look small and uh, plus lenses to uh, look big and even uh, in the uh, even the horizontally it is short then we can give the cylindrical power also, you know, vice versa, 180 degree or 90 degree. Uh, we can give uh, wherever you, we want the magnification or minif minification. So we can do some op optical illusion after fitting the customized process also. Uh, Ma'am, I think I've done with it. Thank you, Celia, for a very elaborate presentation. Uh, as part of her introduction, a very important thing that I missed to us. Now she is part of our, uh, she is in charge of ocularity at Congress. She's a visiting ocularist consultant. So thank you, Celia. Uh, can you stop sharing? Yeah. Sanju, we are going to the next stop or any queries you're taking up now? We have a query uh let's answer session at the end okay okay fine okay. i hope my slide is visible and i'm audible enough yeah it's fine so good evening, everybody, once again. So uh, before I begin my talk, there'll be a lot of overlap uh, as to what Celia already mentioned. Uh, please take it that I wanted to get the points across again. Okay, so I start the presentation with this phrase, an auspicious eye and a dropping eye. So these are words uh, in the play Hamlet, where the poet mentions an auspicious eye referring to a happy eye and dropping eye referring to a, a sad eye. So why this term? In 1914, in an article that came uh, explaining the technique of tarsography in patients with artificial eyes, this was mentioned referring to the artificial eye as the one which was the dropping eye and the better looking eye as auspicious eye. So are we right in branding it so? Let's see. So what's the role of an ophthalmologist? So we, uh, if there's anything related to the eye, the first person that sees would be an ophthalmologist, of course. So we need to identify who are the eligible or suitable patients. We need to examine thoroughly. We need to counsel them and refer them in time to an ocularist. So who is an ideal patient? So you saw the indications that Celia had in her presentation. Just going through the months again. So this is a child with microphthalmos. Another indication is congenital anophthalmos, which can be unilateral or bilateral. Patients who have had intra uh, ocular tumors for which they have undergone uh, enucleation, followed by volume replacement in the form of uh, implants like um, ball implants or dermis fat grafts. 
patients who have un- had uh, orbital trauma or uh, ocular trauma and the uh, eye has uh, given up and gone in for thysis or self-inflicted injuries such as this and even patients who are bilaterally are blind. So basically patients who can tolerate shells and who do not have pain are ideal patients. So one particular indication that is an ophthalmos of uh, congenital and ophthalmos. So there was a, uh, you had seen that serial conformers were used to enlarge the shell, so uh, enlarge the socket. So why is this? So in a normal person, the bone socket growth happens when there is a stimulus. So the stimulus is usually the presence of an eyeball or be it normal sized, the stimulus is the eyeball. So in a patient with an ophthalmos, that stimulus is lacking. So instead, what we do is we provide serial sized uh, conformers that will induce expansion. And similarly, there are expandable implants that are uh, available, which are inserted into the socket and slowly it is enlarged. This way, you're preparing the socket so that it can hold a retained uh, prosthesis later. And of course, eccentration processes that you already saw. How do you go about examining a patient with prosthesis? First, with the prosthesis, you look at the overall cosmesis. So in this picture, you can see that the patient does not have a good cosmesis. There is obviously a difference in color. The eye is looking exo. So number one, prosthesis position. Then whether there's any discharge or not whether the phonises are okay. Uh, often there might be patients who have shelving wherein a, a, a shell will tend to fall out, which needs to be corrected surgically. Similarly, they may have associated entropion or ectropion, which also need to be corrected surgically. And relative in ophthalmos, as to how much of volume uh, enhancement the prosthesis gives. As important as examining with the prosthesis is to examine without the prosthesis. So by looking at the socket, you will be able to know how well the patient looks after his prosthesis and socket. So you need to see if it is healthy or whether it looks like this. So by looking at this, you can see that it is very congested. You can see a lot of granulation tissue. That means two things. Either there has been frequent shell handling without the adequate use of uh, lubricants or the patient has not been cleaning or maintaining the shell properly. If it is a thysical eye, you need to see if there is ciliary tenderness. If this is present, then the patient will not be able to tolerate a shell and you will have to advise an uh, uh, evisceration with implant followed by a prosthesis later. Next, what type of implant is present? Whether it's a ball implant or whether it's a dermis fat graft whether it's centered or it has migrated elsewhere, whether it's well, well covered or whether there's exposure. If there's exposure, that needs to be corrected first before we go ahead with the prosthesis. Very important to note if there is adequate surface and volume. And like I mentioned earlier, bony growth. So most, uh, there are some patients, in spite of having a very good prosthesis, they would still be concerned about the reduced bony growth on that side. In that case, we need to uh, take them up for reconstruction procedures. So this is a video where you examine the prosthesis. So, uh, like Celia said, you have to look for whether there is uh, there are debris, whether there's there are scratches, whether the surface is smooth or not. Sometimes the edges can be really sharp. So this can cause uh, tiny abrasions on the conjunctiva, resulting in discharge, and it can even lead to contracture of the socket eventually. So uh, patients, when they are, uh, come to us, just as we examine uh, the socket, you also have to examine the other eye because often it might be a case of uh, retinoblastoma. So they might have lesions in the other eye or since it's the only seeing good eye, uh, if there's uh, peripheral degenerations that need to be taken care of and they need to be co- called up for close follow-up. Not just giving, dispensing a good prosthesis, you also need to ensure the protection of the normal eye. It's very sad to see that uh, most of the patients who come with prosthesis have half-rimmed glasses. I don't know how it gets around, but 
the danger of using a half rim glasses is if subjected to any sort of trauma it can easily give way and it can result in ocular injuries so always ensure that the patient has a full framed glasses with a preferably polycarbonate material for a patient who comes to you for the first time especially a thysical eye it is very important to do this investigation which is an ultrasound b scan okay so uh, what this helps is one it's a baseline investigation and it helps you to know what the intraocular structures are also in the same sitting itself you can take the axial length of the other eye so that later if you plan a procedure that will help you determine the size of the implant that needs to be put within so in this particular uh, case report uh, it was a patient with a thysical eye but he developed pain and it started to grow over the uh, over a period of few months so on serial ultrasound it was noticed that there was a growing intraocular tumor and which uh, later on histopathology was diagnosed as primary adenocarcinoma of pigmented ciliary epithelium so now i and i hope the retina of uh, retina fellows understand why i keep pestering them with p scan for a thysical eye so being the first person that a patient comes to before an ocularist we do the preliminary counseling to the patient obviously their first question is madam is this a permanent solution obviously you tell them no for them permanent means it's fixed within the eye and you don't have to remove and take care of it then the next question is madam if we go elsewhere will we get something uh, that is different so you tell them no worldwide this is the accepted norm then there is a tendency to use shell like contact lenses so often patients do come and say that they remove the shell and they place it in uh, water overnight which i'm sure celia I, it's i think it's not necessary and uh, as mentioned uh, following shell hygiene is very important and patients who can afford i insist on the use of lubricants because it helps take care of uh, taking care of uh, removing debris from time to time and maintaining the health of the shell as well shell and the socket as well and emphasize on the need for follow to come for uh, polishing regular polishing as well as examination of the other eye so i'm uh, just bringing to your notice an interesting case so this is a 19 year old female she gives a history of uh, retinoblastoma for which she was uh, in the left eye for which she was operated enucleation was done and radiation was also given to the socket at that time later she uh, underwent a dermis fab graft implantation but uh, the post op did not go well hence she was uh, lost to follow up at that center now she's come to me with the hope of having a prosthesis fitted so let's take a closer look at her socket this is how her lids look basically you cannot distinguish the lids separately they are plastered to the socket and uh, if you notice uh, it's just not the socket that stares at you there is also an obvious asymmetry between the mala prominences on either side probably due to radiation so uh, when she said so i was wondering what is it that i could give her so excentration prosthesis for a 19 year old female maybe we could do better correct so from time immemorial uh, surgeons have been resorting to the use of flaps whereby they line sockets so this was an article that came out in the 19th century where a patient had undergone a flap to line the socket and later was fitted with an artificial prosthesis so then why not so i referred her to a trusted friend and a very skilled plastic surgeon who along with his team of doctors did an arduous 12 hour surgery for her we created lids for her and with the help of a temporoparietal fascia lined the socket and the oral maxillofacial surgeon also did the reconstruction of a malar prominence with an ileal uh, uh, graft bone graft so this was her at post op uh, week 1 this is one month post op now we are able to at least fit in a uh, um, conformer and the flap is taking up well uh, a week ago she has undergone uh, lateral canthal suturing and reconstruction 
and her socket has started to granulate. She is far from being fitted with an ocular prosthesis, but now at least she has a hope of having one. So uh, sharing a few of our patients, uh, currently we have around 65 to 70 patients who are in need of a shell and uh, we have dispensed around 30 of them. These are some of our patients. A uh, special mention to this patient, what makes her very special is, yes, her age. She underwent an uh, evisceration for a co perforated corneal ulcer with prolapse of the contents. And later she was fitted with this prosthesis and she has regained her normalcy and she is very happy. So let's rephrase the first sentence. Let's not give them a dropping eye and an auspicious eye. Let's give them an auspicious pair of eyes. Thank you. And you, it was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Ayla, madam. Any queries in the chat? Anju, uh, Anju and Celia, both of you, very informative. And uh, actually, I think this awareness should be created to all ophthalmologists because quite often motivation is the most important thing I think we, we need to encourage patients to have. I think we should have all these pictures around us. <laughs> You're working on that, man. Very nice, beautiful eyes. And I think quite often what happens is quite old, uh, as you have uh, rightly said, uh, 93 year old patient uh, needs a lot of motivation from the patient, bystanders, us also to uh, uh, encourage them to have a proper prosthesis. Otherwise, uh, quite often we land up with the uh the usual stock uh, processes if at all <laughs> yeah very nice and very artistically done celia and anju both of you very nice thank you, thank you. uh the uh, any questions from the listeners uh celia it was a wonderful talk now could you just highlight about the cost part of it and your celia uh yeah ma'am uh, sure, we have actually uh, three to four uh, packages uh, because we use uh, uh, different types of acrylic uh, PMMA. Uh, we use Indian materials, Indian dental materials, uh, white and clear uh, PMMA. So for that, we are charging 16,000. And uh, also we have a, a important material. We are importing material from uh, Canada, a plastic company. Uh, so for that, we are charging 26,000 and obviously, uh, uh, in, you know, both have lifelike appearance and we are uh, uh, customizing it, but still uh, in the quality of the processes will be good in that, uh, you know, especially made for that PMMA for the ocular processes, the imported ones. And always, uh, uh, you know, not all the patients will be able to uh, afford it. And for that patients, which is very uh, hard to afford uh, this processes, then we, we have economical packages for them also. Uh, at least 10,000 or less than 10,000. Thank you, Celia. I have a doubt. Um, in fact, I have, uh, this is one of the patients uh, who had uh, this processes done in uh, Cochin. Mm. Actually, now it seems the, the eyeball is, eye, uh, the artificial eye is rotating all around. It was run, done by the ocularist there. Would she have to change it or is it possible to do something to increase the volume or what would you say if it is becoming loose? Yeah, ma'am, most of the time, uh, rotating processes, uh, you know, we can, uh, we can see for a, uh, a modification in the same processes, but it doesn't help uh, uh, most of the time. We should be... Uh, going for a new uh, imp uh, impression maybe That's because of uh, maybe because of uh, bad impression also will cause a rotation you know the fitting uh, is very important in child and you know the round type of uh, uh, sockets uh, the rotation is a very common thing so when uh, when we do the uh, wax modeling itself we should stop the rotation and then uh, we, we we should go for a final uh, fitting actually for a, for a year and a half she was okay yeah now it has started i think the volume is shrinking probably the fat shrinkage or something why it is uh, she she is planning to go to the florist but uh, then she asked me 
that's what i thought because volume really? reduction is possible but increasing in the in the same process yeah, it is possible it is possible it is yeah it is possible increasing in the volume in the same processes it is possible because we can add uh, a transparent pmma over that we will uh, add wax more, uh, in uh, in the same processes and we will see the uh, size and in the same wax we will replicate into, into the pmma so we can add more pmma and polymerize it it is possible uh, celia one doubt See, when you have blind children, do their parents bring them for this cosmetic blemish? That is, anyway, they're not seeing, but do the parents yeah, bring them? Uh, Ninety percentage of the parents want uh, them, you know, uh, they don't want to see them like a, a blind uh, thing. Uh, so they, they at least want uh, the face should be looking normal. So uh, bilateral and ophthalmia cases, most of the patients, you know, they will just running, running for this uh, processes, you know, uh, it is very uh, desperating their story because every month they have to come for a uh, conformer change, but still they do it, you know, for the bilateral uh, uh, child. And we, uh, we have fitted more patients, but you know, I didn't have consent of the, uh, that patients, but still uh, I'll take it next time. I'll show you. We have patients, even in Comtrust, we have two, three patients waiting for bilateral. Because when we, are, we uh, have some blind school children doing some performance, and all their eyes will be mm, yeah. cosmetically, yeah. Yeah, it should so be something like wandering know. eyes. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, should, it will be wandering eyes only because, you know, the eye movements will be there. But still, we can uh, we can give them a, a proper look. You know, at least 80% of that eye uh, looks normal uh, for the other people. Yeah, because that's a social stigma. No? That's yeah. one thing. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we what have... we have to what we have to highlight is uh, from the very uh, I think from infancy onwards, especially an ophthalmia, very very severe yeah. microphthalmos. All these cases where we ophthalm we ophthalmologists are more concerned about vision and visual recovery uh, are not concerned about the cosmetic part of it for a very long time often. So that is what we have to stress upon that they need follow up from that age onwards with, when we need to uh, increase the volume yeah. by conformers. I'm, I'm very so, sorry to say many, many of the ophthalmologists they advised them to wait till 18 years of uh, age to have a prosthesis. But it's a very uh, uh, you know bad advice because you know when they come to us and at, at the eighteen a, a, a years of age we won't be able to do anything you know I am struggling with the contracted socket to uh, increase the volume you know sometimes we have to go for the DFG and the uh, socket reconstruction and all uh, it was just a word you know uh, referring an ocularist you know just go there and see what they can do because I'm sure you know. Uh, it, in my 10 years experience, I'm telling you, uh, if you send any patients, I can give you something uh, to hide that defect, something, uh, you know, they will be happy, at least, you know, something is better than nothing. That, that is, the, that is the biggest uh, take home message we have to convey here, because from the very beginning, from infancy onwards, we can do something because as you, as you have already pointed out, they come when uh, during marriage years, when very little can be done to increase the volume and surgical or uh, uh, otherwise. So th that, that's very, very important. This, uh... Yeah, and also ma'am, one more thing, the stock eyes, when we see um, many patients who are, who are, uh, who's using stock eyes and ready-made eyes, but we have to see that uh, symmetry, you know, if they're, uh, if they're not matching with the other eye and the size is not good and the prosthetic motility is not there and definitely you have to refer an ocularist, you know, maybe they, they can do better uh, job. Uh, because I have seen many, uh, you know, these two weeks, uh, Ocularis have uh, fitted artificial eyes and, you know, it uh, looks like same uh, stock eyes. You know, the uh, socket measurement won't be good and, you know, they won't be able to close the eye. We had a uh, recent uh, patient in Comtras itself, you know, they have fitted in Aravind, uh, uh, they're serving many patients, I'm, uh, I know that. But still, you know, we, they have a very busy OPD, so they, you know, they're just dispensing uh, just like that. So most of the time they'll have uh, a bad prosthesis, uh, you know, sometimes. So uh, when we examine the prosthesis, we'll be able to know that, you know, whether it is good or not, and whether it is fitting inside the socket or, you know, uh, movement is good or not. Uh, and if you find anything to be improved, then please uh, send to us, you know, we can just correct it. We can, uh, we can at least give something to the patient.
I'm really happy that you have taken up this uh, Malabar area for a uh, uh, which was lacking. Uh, we have tried this quite often since long past so many years to have a regular follow up of patients because once in a while is not enough. Yeah. So that is very, very, I think it's a very, very important, great step uh, towards aesthetic aspect also because ophthalmologists have to definitely think that the face face has to the, the aesthetic value also has to be counted not just vision yeah ma'am in two months time we have consulted more than 40 patients and we have dispensed more than 20 prostheses and uh, 10 is uh, under uh, conformer uh, uh, treatment and you know they'll be fitting in this month itself so in two months time, 20 patient is a very good number in my experience because, in, you know, I uh, travel in ma many hospitals and they hardly get once in a month, uh, two, two to three patients in a month. But in Malabar area, Kannur, Kasaragod, Kalikat, in that area, I think uh, there are more patients. I don't know, maybe the population is big and <laughs> according no, to that area, 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 definitely right. the need is there. Definitely yeah, the maybe. need is there. Yeah. You need to be here for a longer time regularly. <laughs> and uh, madam one more suggestion i would suggest is uh, see now the ophthalmologist first should become aware of it second we will we can give i mean make them give a talk in the ima also yeah. so that more people will i think aware. this navati should should have been a good good platform yeah, uh, with the dermatologists <laughs> you know dermatologists are giving a lot of uh, advertisement now uh, for because of course uh, the 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 it's a dermatologist there who is the secretary so no doubt that uh, there is a lot of aesthetic uh, uh, talks being uh, going around so i think uh, uh, why don't you viji take it up in vima yeah okay madam we'll do it uh, that's why i didn't want this to be just a clinical meeting of congress madam that's why i told anju and celia let's have it in the first in our Good society idea. yeah i congratulate all of you viji sujit uh, Celia, Anju, all of you uh, for taking it to the uh, to a uh, larger platform, and yeah. I think uh, awareness should be created exactly. now that we have her here, Celia here. Uh, Celia, one doubt: uh, this course, no, after uh, optometry, you go for this course, or uh, how is the? Uh... Yeah, ma'am. In India, uh, after optometry, you can go for a, a comprehensive, uh, uh, you know, not comprehensive, especially for the ocularistry. We have 18 years, uh, 18 months fellowship in L LV Prasad. Only okay. LV Prasad is running a proper, uh, you know, training for this ocularistry. Aravind is having, and you know, Shankaranatral is having. Everybody, they have two weeks program. And I'm sure that, you know, nobody can do in uh, two weeks a processes because socket, you know, there are a lot of things to learn about sockets. And we have to be very thorough about uh, socket if you want to dispense something. Otherwise, patient is going to suffer. You know, they won't be able yeah. to close the lid uh, with yeah. that. So, and in India, only LV Prasad is having a proper training, 18-month uh, training. And when I used to be there, uh, it was two-year training. Uh, and nowadays, it is actually 18 months training. And in that 18 months, they are posting uh, six, six months in oculoplasty de uh, department and six months in um, ocularistry. So I don't know, uh, like, you know, uh, anyway, still it is good other than this two weeks training. And out of India, we can go uh, without optometry also. If you have an artistic background, we can go for a five-year training. Five-year ocularistry doctor of uh, uh, optometry, just like that. We have a ocularistry training also, oh. and uh, and we have anaplastology. Uh, John Hopkins University have fellowship in uh, anaplastology. You know, if you if you have a medical illustration background or you know medical artistic background, you can go for a um, fellowship. I applied for that John Hopkins, but uh, you know uh, uh, nowadays I'm uh, active in politics, so I won't be able to travel. <laughs> <laughs> so I just attended our training in Nashville, USA. That's all. Okay. But we have. Where, where, where is the lab situated, Celia? I, uh, I practiced in my home only, ma'am. I was I have a clinic in Nangamali, but uh, in COVID time I just dropped it because uh, in thirty uh, days in a month, twenty days I'm traveling. So only ten days I'll be sitting in the uh, clinic. So I transferred clinic to my home. In upstairs, I uh, set up a lab and clinic uh, oh. both. So I own patients. I'll my own patients. I'll uh, do it here, and otherwise I'll go to hospitals. Okay, thank you, Celia, for all. Uh, one more, one more. Hello, madam. Viji. Hello, Doctor Viji and Raila, madam. Doctor Anjali. Yes, Raila. Hi. 
കേക്കാമോ മാഡം ഐ ഹാവ് ബീൻ ലിറ്റിൽ ഔട്ട് ഓഫ് ദിസ് സെഷൻ ബിക്കോസ് ഓഫ് എ കോൾ ഐ ജസ്റ്റ് വോണ്ടഡ് ടു നോ വെദർ വി ഹാവ് ബീൻ ഗെറ്റിംഗ് പോസ്റ്റ് എക്സൻട്രേഷൻ കേസസ് ഷീ ഇസ് ടേക്കിംഗ് മാഡം because we have many patients here yeah. who have been coming for review after mucomycosis ex uh, and orbital eccentration so i have been trying at angamali one she ji is there no okay yeah, yeah. yeah, so i have talked yeah. to her for a patient now i didn't i never knew that you yeah here in our own town <laughs> yeah so we have many patients in our uh, department and ent department coming for review yeah. so i i will definitely be sending those patients to for uh, this processes yeah sure ma'am okay. orbital process we are doing but uh, nowadays you know it takes a lot of time to uh, do the wax modeling uh, for that orbital process so we have to plan according to that only that we have to counsel the patients and it is a little, a little expensive because we are using silicon materials and it is, it is very expensive one pack of silicon it, itself is 1 lakh and all so patient if the patient is affording we can do that otherwise we can have some sponsorship for that you know if we uh, if somebody is uh, sponsoring and then uh, we'll take it up സൈഡ് വ്യൂ so uh, and uh, when they take out spectacles it is same like that so patient won't be able to uh, in a patient won't be happy with the spectacle mounted one and uh, we have to do it with the acrylic one if it should be stable and always uh, the same cost we can do a uh, uh, silicon process then why should we go for a, a spectacle mounted and it is very easy also glued one you know it, the margins won't be visible and we can give a spectacles to hide that margin if it is visible okay thank you so much vinni uh, and uh, dr ranju excellent session thank you thank you ma'am uh, celia there's one question for you from dr rohi uh, approximately at what frequency does the prosthesis need to be changed in children uh, it's a uh, very uh, depends upon uh, you know in some uh, children ma'am most of the time in 2 years uh, you know when we start at the age of 5 uh, um, most of the uh, people you know we are seeing 3 to 4 years they are using the same processes and in between we uh, usually give a, a modification in the same processes and after that if it is not fitting then we will go for a new one and in some patients you know in 6 months um, size will be changing in, in very rare cases so we won't be able to predict it but in 3 to 4 years time we need, maybe we, we need a change otherwise a modification that's all okay i don't know if dr uh, saumya madam is here she had a question for you okay i'm asking it on her be- behalf okay. so there was a child with microphthalmos but uh, vision of 2 by 60 and around um, 3 to 4 mm difference so uh, preserving the central vision is there any option that we have to make it yeah. apart from yeah. Yeah. yeah ma'am we uh, we do uh, some cases like that you know uh, we will make a prosthesis clearer lens uh, with a clear uh, portion in the uh, send, uh, in the pupil area uh, th- this is practically uh, uh, possible but uh, when the patient started using it and it doesn't help for a 2 by 60 uh, vision you know uh, uh, with a clear a pmma that kind of quality we won't be able to give us uh, in in just like uh, spectacles so practically if you ask me uh, whether it is possible then it is possible because with a clear portion we can have a scleral uh, uh, shell but uh, in effect that doesn't help patients in the in vision uh, thing because optically uh, how can it be possible it's a convex uh, of surface is coming in front of that it will be transparent but in a convex uh, uh, space only they they're seeing it so uh, it is possible but if in effect patient doesn't uh, have any advantages in that but uh, hide hiding that 2 by 60 vision uh, it is possible we can give a scleral lens over that i think it doesn't uh, affect patient if they don't want uh, that 2 by 60 it is so clear no. then they can manage with the other eye if they are very uh, conscious about the their okay is that the clue it's an option for them uh, yeah. you can try it okay.
Anybody else have any doubts? Anju, yes. what would you say the 2 by 60 vision uh, do you want to cover the eye in the shell? I wouldn't. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to know uh, what the others would say also. I think even a one or two meter vision counts when there is a uh, regarding the field. I don't think that uh, we should uh, deny that uh, vision. True. But ma'am, some patients, they... they yeah, of course, it is up to them. Yeah, it, it's up, it, to, it is them, up to them, but we have to tell them. If yeah. you don't want that, fine. But uh, from our part, I think better not to advise. Yeah. Celia, since you're into politics, I just want to ask one question. Is there any government grant or anything anything for this? No, ma'am. Uh, till now, we don't have it this, because this is a cosmetic rehabilitation. So uh, yeah. we don't have any kind of insurance. Even insurance won't cover this. And we are trying it, uh, you know, uh, all India level. Uh, we are trying. Yeah, something uh, should be done. Yeah, something should be done. Uh, and we are getting a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the sponsorship and, you know, retinoblastoma society also can help us uh, for the retinoblastoma patients. Any NGOs? And, uh, yeah, NGOs can help, uh, you know, many people. Even I do, uh, uh, I help uh, many patients with a, a sponsorship. Even our patient is uh, uh, ready to sponsor for the other patient. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> a good initiative. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, Celia, once more. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, now, next, what we need from Celia is to start a course herself before she becomes yeah, a Yeah, that's bad. Uh, that's what I want. Let me ask about the course and things like that because much human resources yeah, are required. Uh, I, uh, one of, two, two, two to three of my students are uh, doing a fellowship in uh, uh, LV Prasad. So, out of that nine students, one student I have actually, I asked them to join in Ocularistry. So, she is doing it. And if she's okay uh, with that, then we will, uh, why not? We will train her. And You have a great potential with all these multifaceted exactly. uh, interests. <laughs> all the best. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Anyway, good. Yeah. Yeah. You have joined Calm Trust. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So yeah. thank you, Anju, for bringing this topic up and introducing Celia. Thank you, Celia.